I am Dr. Georgiana Stanchu, curator at the Royal Canadian Regiment Museum in London, Ontario. I am happy to welcome you for our fifth RCRM speaker series. And today's topic is the Aerodrome of Democracy, the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan in Southwestern Ontario with Mike Baker. Between 1939 and 1945, the Royal Canadian Air Force saw greater expansion than the Army or the Navy. With over 200,000 men and 17,000 women enlisted, 39 RCF squadrons at home, number six RCAF group with RAF Bomber Command, the RCAF became the fourth largest air force in the world at the end of the war. There were many components to this unprecedented expansion, but one of them in particular attracted Michael Baker's attention, the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. A graduate of the University of Western Ontario with degrees in history and education, Michael Baker is the manager of museums and archives for the county of Elgin in St. Thomas. He is well known to the regional historians as the, as the collections curator at Fanshawe Pioneer Village and the curator of regional history at Museum London, but also as the editor of Downtown London, Layers of Time, and the co-editor with Hilary Bates Neary of 100 Fascinating Londoners and Street Names of London an illustrated guide, both published by James Lorimer of Canada. He is a former president of the London branch of the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario and the Heritage London Foundation, and also a past president of the Elgin Historical Society. At the outbreak of the Second World War, Prime Minister William Mackenzie King believed that Canada should play a supporting role in the conflict, one which would not require sending large numbers overseas. From the beginning, Mackenzie King participated in negotiations with Britain and other Commonwealth countries for creating a large training capability in Canada. An agreement was reached in December 1939 for what will be more commonly known as the BCATP, or British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. Air and ground crews for the personnel recruited in all of the Allied countries received training in Canada between 1940 and 1945. Of the 14 RCAF stations, established in southwestern Ontario during this time, the airports of Tilsonborg and of St. Thomas were the direct result of bases built for the plan. The physical reminders of the wartime signs can be found at these locations and elsewhere across the country in the form of hangars or surviving outbuildings. Michael Baker's talk focuses on each of the types of training facilities, including elementary and advanced flying, air observer, bombing and gunnery, each of which could be found within a few miles of London. Let's listen to Michael Baker's presentation. 2019 marked the 80th anniversary of the inception of one of Canada's greatest contributions to the Second World War the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. President Roosevelt, when he congratulated Prime Minister King on the success of the plan in 1943, called Canada the aerodrome of democracy, a phrase actually written for him by Lester Pearson. Essentially, it was a plan to train thousands of airmen at hundreds of bases across Canada, manned by Air Force and civilian personnel. Southwestern Ontario, because of its wide open stretches of flat farmland and its proximity to two large lakes, became home to more than a dozen bases. In the immediate vicinity of London, five bases were constructed, each providing specialized instruction. Two for pilots, one for air observers or navigators, one for bomb aimers and gunners, and one for ground crew. This talk, looks at what survives of these bases today 
and at what life was like on them during the war. This is the London Free Press headline that greeted Londoners on October 10, 1939, just a month after war was declared. The estimate given here that the plan would graduate 25,000 personnel a year turned out to be about right. 2,000 a month was the average number of graduates it produced. From the start of the plan in April of 1940 to its con official conclusion on March 31st, 1945. In the table below are the actual numbers trained over the course of the plan. It produced 130,000 airmen in total, made up of 70,000 Canadians, over 40,000 RAF, nearly 10,000 Australians, and 7,000 New Zealanders. To this must be added about 40,000 ground crew the figure that's actually rarely mentioned in official tallies of the plan's graduates. While most of the BCATP graduates came from British Empire countries, the plan also trained nearly 3,500 personnel from elsewhere, including French, Czechoslovakian, Norwegian, Poles, Belgians, and Dutch. In addition to the servicemen, the base is also employed about 100,000 civilians in various capacities. That something on this scale could take shape this soon into the war was due to the fact that a similar plan had been under discussion since 1938. The new plan was proposed and accepted in September and the details were hammered out by December. During negotiations, Prime Minister King held out for Canadian as opposed to RAF control and for RCAF squadrons to be established overseas. He also insisted on naming it the Commonwealth Air Plan. Elsewhere, it would be known as the Empire Air Training Scheme, but, but King felt the word Commonwealth, which itself had been in existence since 1926, would make it easier to sell to the country, especially in Quebec. The total cost was projected to be over two billion dollars, quite a lot in 1939. In fact, it was three times the size of that year's entire federal budget. The money would be used for about 8,000 buildings, 700 of which would be hangars, and over 100 airfields, 80 to be built from scratch. The plan would also need about 3,500 aircraft, including Ansons, Harvards, Tiger Moths, Fleet Finches, and ferry battles. Most of this cost was taken on by Britain. Five schools were built in our immediate vicinity. Bombers and gunners were trained in Fingal, a few miles west of St. Thomas. London had both an air observer school and an elementary flying school, which taught basic flying. To the south near Elmer was an advanced flying school called a service training flying school. And south of St. Thomas, the RCAF took over the newly built psych hospital and created a school for ground crew. The lake was the key reason for building here. It was used for bombing and gunnery practice and to supply the bases with water. The Fingal base built a pipeline from the lake, both for drinking water and to supply its fire hydrants. This was an important on a base composed of wooden buildings, tightly packed together and heated by coal stoves. The open space offered by the lake also provided a place for ditching instead of going down over populated areas. The farms and communities in southwestern Ontario made it easy to supply the bases with food, coal, and personnel. Remnants of most of the schools can still be found today. Perhaps the oddest facility to be transformed into a training plan base was the newly completed mental hospital south of St. Thomas. The first patients had just arrived in 1939 from Penetanguishene when the whole site was offered to the government for the war effort and the patients sent back. It was an ideal location. The buildings were essentially big dorms surrounding a built-in parade square. And as an added bonus, 
the buildings already had bars in the window, so no one could escape. At the lower left is the nurse's residence on the west side of Sunset Drive, now the county building. It was converted to house officers' quarters. And they were no doubt happy to learn that the underground tunnel system that connected all the buildings also extended under the road to their quarters. Several hangars needed to be built to serve as the actual instruction areas. These two hangars were built for aero engine and flight maintenance training. Eventually, four hangars were built along with the combined drill and recreation hall seen here. Though none of these additional buildings remain today. Known as number one technical training school, it was unique among the plan's hundreds of facilities in that it produced only ground crew. Over 20,000 graduated from here, about 2,000 every six months. Many of them were sent to work at other air training plan bases. Graduates included aircraft technicians, aero engineers, airframe and instrument mechanics, and fabric and sheet metal workers. In some cases, nothing is left of the base except the telltale triangular shape of the runways, it being easier to plow around them than to remove them. The upper two images are of number 31 RAF Air Navigation School at Port Albert near Godridge. In the present day view on the left, the runways appear to be almost usable and nearby are four empty pads where the hangars once stood. The wartime image on the right is the reverse view, looking west towards Lake Huron. The lower image is of number four bombing and gunnery school near Fingal. Today the base itself is part of a nature preserve with walking trails. Only a few hydrants and some concrete building fragments now occupy an area where close to 1800 servicemen and women and civilians once worked. The blue square marks the location of a surviving hangar pad. At left is one of the interpretive signs placed at various points along the original road system, most of which is still visible. Often, if anything survives at all, it's the hangars, or at least the paved surface, usually in use as a parking lot. Near Elmer, the Ontario Police College occupies the former site of a service flying training school, an SFTS, and has, since 1963, slowly replacing original buildings with new facilities. Simulated car chases now take place in the former runways, and one of the two surviving hangars contains a full-scale mock-up of a downtown and a two-story domestic setting. At Dunville, also a service flying training school, all five hangars survived from the war. In the early 60s, the property was sold to a group of businessmen who for the next 30 years raised turkeys there. It was then bought by the folks who started the museum, which is housed in one of the hangars. Centralia, another service flying training school, is now an extensive flight center where all of the original hangars are still in use. In London, only one small building survives from the two schools that once occupied what was then the entire airport. Indicated here by the red arrow, it was originally the base canteen and is now a museum operated by 427 Wing of the RCAF Association of Canada. Former hangar locations are indicated here with blue squares. Crumlin Road, coming in from the bottom, still runs north through the site, and Huron Street comes in from the left. London's two schools for air observers and for elementary flying together covered most of the area in this view, which is the north end of the present airport. London had just decided to move the airport from Lambeth uh, to its present location when the war broke out. In fact, work started on September the 9th, the day before Canada's official declaration of war. 
The new airport, leased to the government, was for the entire duration of the war. While London's does not, other present-day airports owe their existence to the BCATP. In St. Thomas, the main hangar and the runways date from the war. It was built as a relief field for the Elmer Service Flying School, a safe place to land the plane if the pilot got into trouble and where some parts of the training program were carried out. Tiltenburg is also a relief field for Elmer and is now the municipal airport. Hamilton moved its airport to the former RCAF base at Mount Hope in 1952. The Nastra near Clinton is built around a former BCATP base, number five radio school, which is largely intact, though many of the buildings are from the post-war era. People will likely recognize the Ray Dome on the left, which once covered the radar array, now located near the traffic lights in downtown Clinton. The base opened in 1941 as a secret RAF facility teaching radar. There was no flying and hence no airfields attached. A rifle range known as the Butts, and usually attached to most bases, was backstopped by this huge concrete wall. At right is one that survives today at the Goddard Airport, which may be all that remains of that former RCAF base. It is now the back wall of a house. Goddard Airport was the site of number 12 elementary flying training school. The Lancaster, that sat there for years was moved to the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum at Mount Hope in 1979 and is now one of only two in the world that still fly. These are the bases that we'll be looking at in more detail. Fortunately, those closest to London each represent one of the key types of training facilities found across the whole of the plan. Number four, Air Observer School and number three, elementary flaming, flying training school or at the London airport. Number 14, service flying training school was near Elmer. Number four, bombing and gunnery school was near Fingal. And number one, technical training school was near St. Thomas. But first, let's look at the training process itself. Why were so many airmen needed? If you think of a typical World War II heavy bomber, such as a Lancaster or a Halifax, each one actually needed seven men to make up a full crew. In this cutaway of a Lancaster, each crewman can be seen in his position in the aircraft. Next to the pilot is the flight engineer, who controlled the plane's many systems and assisted with takeoff and landing. Behind them is the navigator, and back of him is the wireless operator who is also a gunner. They were known as wireless air gunners or WAGs. The bomb aimer below is in the front and could also serve as a gunner. And finally there is both a mid upper and an aft gunner. From 1942 onwards the Lancaster became the mainstay of the British Hemi Bopper fleet. By the end of the war in Europe there were roughly 50 squadrons equipped with the Lancaster and they were part of almost every major bombing raid. Of the 7,000 Lancasters flown in the war, 3,300 were lost. That's over 20,000 airmen that needed to be replaced. Bomber Command would lose 55,000 out of a total airman strength of about 125,000 or 44%. How did you get in to one of these schools? Once you enlisted, you were sent to one of several manning pools or depots. In Toronto, it was the Coliseum at the CNE. Here they received two hours of physical education every day and instruction in marching, rifle drill, foot drill, saluting, and other routines. From here, you were usually sent in guard duty to a base nearby. Aircraftman second class, George Keane, pictured here, 
who was later a navigator and from London, Ontario, was sent to St. Thomas to guard the base there. Remedial high school education was offered to bring the 17 and 18 year old trainees up to the RCAF academic level. There was also a standard aptitude test for classification. After four or five weeks, a selection committee decided whether the trainee would be placed in the air crew or ground crew stream. After this, air crew were sent to an ITS, an initial training school. Here they received the basics in aircraft operation, aerodynamics, navigation, map reading, as well as self-defense and more foot drill. It was at this point that you were sorted into pilots or navigators, or if neither of those, into wireless operators or gunners. Navigators and gunners were in greatest demand. Twice the gunners were needed for every plane, and navigators needed to be good with numbers. Accountants and bank tellers, for example, were usually headed for navigator school. If one was selected as a pilot, you went on to an EFTS, an, ele an elementary flying training school. Here you learned to fly a biplane, like a fleet finch or a tiger moth. The elementary flying school in London was number three EFTS, one of 30 across the country. It was open in June of 1940 and closed in July of 42, producing 681 grads in those two years. As with most of the EFTS schools, number three was operated by a private flying club, in this case, the London Flying Club. Most of the people who could fly at all in 1939 were civilians, and most were members of flying clubs, and so the government turned to them for help. The clubs would set up a separate company and sign a contract with the government to train pilots. The elementary flying course was eight weeks long. They received instruction in engine and airframe theory, navigation, aircraft instrumentation, and acquired 50 hours of flying time. Some had as little as nine and a half hours flying before they soloed. This is a fleet finch, a biplane, which was the easiest type of plane to handle for new recruits, and supposedly harder to crash, but it could be done, especially it seems if trees were involved. As with all the bases, students came from everywhere, including the United States, before December of 1941. A new class arrived at number three every two months, and a free press photographer was routinely dispatched to get a shot of the new students. These are the free press photos from March and May of 1941. The training period at the EFTS got shorter and shorter over the course of the war, shrinking down to 24 days near the end, and by then there was little distinction between the elementary and the service line courses. When number three closed in 1942, the civilian mechanics were dispersed to other schools. One, Don Williams, seen here on the left, from a farm near St. Thomas, left for number 31 EFTS in DeWinton, Alberta. This is a letter of recommendation for him on the letterhead of the company set up by the London Flying Club to run the school. R.H. Cronin, listed as vice president, was a businessman who had assisted in selecting the new airport site. The London Airport also housed an Air Observer School number four, AOS. This is a later view of the airport around 1943, after the school had been greatly enlarged. Crumlin Road cuts across the center of the photo from left to right, and Heron Street is at the upper left. You're looking northwest. That surviving base canteen is hidden in the trees and located by a red dot. Number four, AOS, opened in September of 1940. And during its almost four years of operation, it graduated 4,439 observers. 
The observer position was the original rationale for the military use of aircraft, taking someone up to observe the enemy's position. By World War II, the observer was really a navigator. They also taught some bomb aiding at observer school, but, the men, but these men would also be sent to a bombing and gunnery school after graduation. Frequently, graduates from number four, AOS, would be sent to number four bombing and gunnery in Fingal. Number four air observer school was also operated by a private contractor. In this case, the Levens Brothers, a Toronto company. Claire and Walter Levens, pictured at right, took over a barnstorming and airmail delivery company started by their family in 1927 near Toronto. By the time of the war, they were running airports, supplying parts, and maintaining aircraft. It stayed a family business and only just closed in 2011. The Levens brothers supplied the pilot trainers and the mechanics, administration, and service staff for number four. The RCAF provided the facilities, the instruction, and the equipment, including the Anson aircraft. Among the trainers, was a man who would later become one of London's best known photographers, Ron Nelson. Nelson started his photography business in the 1930s, but he was also a flyer. And as you can see, he's one of the civilian instructors. He's pictured in the far right. Number four AOS was an ideal place for him because here he could combine his two favorite endeavors. His photos regularly appear in the base newsletter. The cover of one issue appears here on the left. Nelson left a great record of this base in the form of a one hour color film he shot in 1944, which included visits to most of the buildings and a training flight cross country to Lake Huron and back. In the lower photo, you can see him working on the film with his associate, Jim Hardy. Entitled Teamwork Unlimited, a copy of this film was still around in 1990 when a local TV channel did a special on the 50th anniversary of the airport. It included an interview with Ron and clips from his film. A copy of this special recently came to light, giving rise to a search for the original film. It was located among the large collection of his work that had recently been donated to Western by the Nelson family. Western kindly digitized the film and made it available with the agreement of the family for this talk. Let's look at a couple of short segments. The first clip is from near the beginning of the film. It starts with Claire and Walt looking at a photo album and then shows a panoramic of the entire base from the roof of one of the hangars, starting from the former elementary flying school and moving around to the observer school which by 1944 occupied the whole base. Ron Nelson was also a trainer on the Link, a flight simulator that trained airmen to fly on instruments alone.
Ron can be seen here in the upper right at the controls of the link trainer. Success in the link was a requirement for the completion of pilot training. Link trainers could be found at both number 14 Elmer and number four Fingal. The pitch and roll of the aircraft you observed was delivered through a series of four bellows, raising and lowering the sides or front or back of the plane as the controls directed. Its inventor, Edwin Link, was a pump organ manufacturer who applied the same technology to the trainer. The trainer communicated with the student through radio and a duplicate instrument panel. The student had to follow a set course using the instruments in the cockpit. The trainer could set weather conditions and even initiate a stall. Navigator George Keane says the controls were so touchy it could stall itself, but maybe he didn't know it was the instructor doing it. The crab referred to was a three-wheeled, self-propelled course plotter recording the student's route on a scale map. A cross-country flight of up to 200 miles was possible, during which the instructor was able to confront the pupil with most of the difficulties that could occur during a genuine flight, including both calm and rough air flying conditions. Following training at the elementary schools, graduates were sent to a service flying training school such as Elmer, one of 15 in Canada. Elmer was number 14, and it was open in July of 1941. The base occupied what had been 600 acres of farmland. The farmers whose land was optioned for the base were given 30 days to clear out. One of them had to dynamite a new silo because it was in a flight path. Enrollment averaged between 900 and 1,000 airmen, added to which were another 130 air women, 100 officers, and 80 civilians. Most of the students were trained on Harvards. There were about 90 on the base, and this is the sound of three going overhead. There were an average of 500 landings at the base every day. While some service training schools used the two-engine Anson, most used the Harvard with a single engine and a control panel that was not unlike most fighters. Training at the elementary schools had been based on 26 clearly defined steps leading from stationary cockpit to flying in formation. This was repeated at the service training schools. The key to success was memorizing a series of letters representing a checklist of things to do before takeoff, and in the right order, of course. HTPM CGT, standing for a hydraulics, trim, mixture, pitch, carburetor, heat, gas, and throttle. The students were required to do cross country navigational flights, reconnaissance missions, and instrument flying, which meant the student had to control the aircraft without looking out the window. Elmer graduated about 4,000 pilots. In its last year, number 14 was actually operated out of Kingston, though, the, though Elmer remained open as an RCAF base. The base recorded 26 fatal accidents, in which 12 instructors and 26 students died. A famous grad is General Richard Romer, after whom the library at the police college is named. His RCAF career included spotting Field Marshal Rommel's car. Charlie Fox may have shot it up and killed Rommel, but Romer spotted it in the first place. Number one TTS moved here after the war, though it was soon disbanded. A Manning Depot was then moved here. It was also disbanded. It was used for summer school for 1,600 air cadets in the 1950s until the RCAF left for good in 1961. Hangars were then used for tobacco and by the Elgin Co-op and the Canadian Canners. The police college opened in 1963 using most of the buildings, but now only two hangars remain. 
Number four bombing and gunnery near Fingal was built between June and November of 1940. Ironically, one of the men working on the construction was Joe Mennell, who would, be on to, who would go on to become the first director of the police college. He recalls in his memoirs that working on the construction of the base inspired him to join the RCAF, which he did. It was located here because of its proximity to the lake. Two of its bombing targets were on the lake, the four others were on land, and eventually a pipeline was built to bring water up to the base. By now the layout should be familiar. A row of hangars, behind which are the barracks, and behind them, school rooms and support buildings, such as stores, mess halls, and the rec hall. This air view from wartime has been placed next to a hand-drawn plan representing the base as it was in 1944, then home to 1,850 occupants, including 130 civilians, which made it the fourth largest town in Elgin County. The hangars each have an H and a number on them. The dark square with the number 20 is the drill hall. Number 21 nearby is the rec hall. Number 60 to the right of the drill hall is the parade square. Here. Number two across from it is the ground instruction school. 5 to 18 are all barracks and mess halls. Each barracks held 136 men. If full, all eight combined would contain over 1,000 men. 15 is the hospital. 24 is motor transport. 39 is the fire hall. 30 is the control tower. And 32 is the camera obscura which was a key part of the bomb aimers training. Towards the bottom of the plan is 26, which is the combined guardhouse and post office, and 35 is the hostess house. After the war, both these buildings were relocated off the base a few miles away and are both still lived in today. The post office site contains one of the few remnants of the base, a large concrete block to which the safe was once chained. The post office could issue money orders, which was likely why a safe was needed. With 50,000 letters coming and going every month, the post office needed three airmen and five leading aircraft women to run it. Just beyond this was a former farmhouse left standing after the base was built. It became the hostess house here on the right. Run by the YMCA, airmen and women went there to relax. The RAF men loved it because it was the only place they could get a good cup of tea. One couple was married in the house and returned there to have their child christened. Volunteers from the immediate area worked there, such as Miss Nora Curtis, a member of a famous local family that included an artist and a doctor. Total visits in one week included 293 airmen, 268 women's division, and 120 cities. Civilian girls at the base could have their lunch there. Sandwiches could be had, as well as pop, hot drinks, sweets, as well as cigarettes at low prices. The men could have their socks darned, their stripes sewn on, and have their 48-hour leaves planned for them. The hospital had 45 beds for minor medical problems. If you had something worse, you were sent to the base hospital at TTS. One of the doctors who served at TTS, squadron, squadron leader Joseph M. James, actually kept the medical charts he used there, which his son recently donated to the Elgin County Archives through the good offices of the Banning House National Historic Site. The fire department had a full-size fire engine here at upper left, and the crew of 12, all with firefighting experience. The base was equipped with an enunciator, which punched a paper tape 
and rang a bell to indicate which alarm box had been pulled. In the center of the slide is the control tower. And to the right and below are two views of the parade square, to give you an idea of the scale of the place. The one on the right looks toward the ground instruction school, the one in the lower left towards the hangars. Either view may have been during a wings parade, and there were many. These is where the graduates were presented with their wings, a couple of which can be seen at the upper right. The base in four years of operation graduated 6,000 men, most of whom went overseas. We've left our potential gunners and bombers back at the ITS, the initial training school. Since the, bomb aim, since the bomb aimer had only one job of fairly short duration, they were also trained initially as wireless operators, the crew member that communicated back to base command. Many came to Fingal from number four air observer school at Crumlin once they had completed the course there. The students at number four bombing and gunnery spent a lot of their time dropping 11 and a half pound bombs on a target measuring about 30 feet square, seen here at lower left. The bombs, here being attached to the underside of an anson, were usually dropped two at a time in each of three passes, with the bomber laying on his stomach for two hours in the nose of the anson, which in winter was quite a trial because there were no heaters in the aircraft. Each bomb, released a 100-foot plume of smoke on impact when a pin punctured a canister of acid inside. The plume was spotted by two observers with a quadrant and precisely plotted. Once recorded, the results were phoned to the station for immediate review when the, pilots, when the students landed. Students dropped 40 bombs in the early years, later increased to 80. You were lucky if one landed closer than 50 yards away. If he did hit the target, you were inducted into the pickle barrel club. So hard was the target to hit, apparently, that it was like hitting a pickle barrel from the air. Inductees received one of the pins pictured at upper right. Students also bombed the Camera Obscura. It's a building with a lens on the roof. When the bomb aimer, had decided he was in the right position to score a direct hit in the building, he flashed a light from the plane at the building, which was reflected through a lens on the roof onto a chart on the floor where the hit or miss would be plotted. This was an area often assigned to the women's division. At Fingal, the whole photo unit was staffed by women's division. At right is their sergeant, with the unlikely name of Florence Nightingale, Processing film uh, from a gunning exercise. There were, in fact, about a hundred women's division on the base, mostly in motor, motor transport as drivers. In addition to the photo unit, they also packed ammo and parachutes and ran the headquarters orderly rooms. At least one course, aircraft recognition, was actually taught by a woman. Her arrival was announced in the base newsletter with the headline, RCAF School Marms Teach Fingal Air Crew. Things have come to a pretty pass, it said, lightheartedly, of course, when a fellow has to join the Air Force to learn a few things from women. Gunnery meant practice on the Browning machine gun, which most of the heavy bombers were equipped with. In the air, Students shot at a large cloth cone called a drogue, which looked like a large windsock and was pulled by a lysander, pictured at upper right. Any hits were identified by colored paint, which the rounds had been dipped in before loading. Each student was assigned a specific color, so you could tell whose was whose. The base closed at the end of the war. For two years, it was used as a hostel for former German prisoners of war. It was abandoned by the RCAF in 1961, and the province took it over as they had with Elmer. At some point, 
a wildlife area was created to be managed jointly by the Ministry of Natural Resources and the Elgin County Stewardship Council. Growth of upland game species, such as grouse, pheasant, quail, and partridge were encouraged for hunting, and the rest of the land was cropped, giving the council a source of revenue. In 1992, the plaque you see at the left was installed, listing the 19 airmen and instructors who had lost their lives while training. They were among a total of 856 student deaths and an unknown number of trainers who were lost throughout Canada over the life of the plan. In 1994, a local resident, Lauren Spicer, who had joined the RCAF near the end of the war as a navigator, proposed turning the site into a walking trail, which he called the War to Roses Trail, using the base's original road system. But training was not all work. Base dances were frequent, as were performances from traveling troops of volunteers, singers, and dancers, for example, the London Life Troopers one of four volunteer entertainment groups organized in London. The newsletter caption to this photo of Hope Wolf, who had recently performed at Fingal in November of 43, gives you an idea of how things have changed since then. No kidding, it says. That luscious blues singer who wilted you at the November 1st show in the recreation hall is really Miss Hope Wolf of London. She's 21, goes to business college during the day, and entertains the services at night. In addition to her voice, Hope has some very fine points, and this aerial reconnaissance view shows how she would appear to a bombardier. She likes airmen and didn't hesitate a minute when we asked her for her phone number for publication. It's Metcalf 9484. Hope didn't run off with an airman. She married Joe Garber, stayed in London, and raised a family which included actor Victor Garber. How long did this all take? If Flight Lieutenant George Keane is any guide, it took a year from enlistment to when you embarked for Europe. In June of 1944, Fingal received a new commanding officer. Squadron Leader William H. Swetman. In March of that year, he had flown his 53rd bombing run as Wing Commander and Squadron Leader. After successfully returning from that, he was awarded a Distinguished Service Order, one of only 14 in the whole RCAF at that time. This he added to a DFC, a Distinguished Flying Cross, which he had been awarded for inspiring confidence in his crews in attacks in the Ruhr Valley. He was 24 years old, becoming the youngest BC ATP commander in the country. He was a graduate of Crumlin, number three EFTS, and number six SFTS in Dunville. Blair Ferguson, who has given the museum a great deal of material on the Fingal Air Base, collected for his book, obtained this clipping from the Toronto Star dated August 16th, 1941, with the photos of 24 airmen who had just received their wings at Fingal. A record was kept of their overseas service and it appears on each picture. Four have various comments, torpedoed on the way over, POW released, boarded home for nerves. One has just a question mark on them. Of the 20 left, only three have OK written on them. The rest are with the other 55,000 men lost by Bomber Command. The losses of men who came out of these schools were staggering, but necessary in the struggle to gain victory for the Allies. The remnants of these schools should serve as a reminder of their sacrifice.
Thank you, Michael, for uh, this outstanding presentation on BCATP, a plan that certified over 130,000 air and ground crew coming from New Zealand, um, Australia, Great Britain, and other countries, as you've told us. Uh, it is definitely um, a research that helps understanding why and how the RCAF became one of the, the important contributions that Canada made to the Second World War. RCRM speaker series continues next month with Michael O'Leary, who will invite us in his study room to unveil some of the hidden gems of regimental life. Hard Labor Beyond the Internet Search will premiere on 16 July 2020 at 6 p.m. Thank you for watching and please subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos.